This episode of Dana Being Dana is brought to you in part by the Wright Center for Women's Health, providing personalized luxury health care. Hello and welcome to Dana Being Dana. That's me and I'm thrilled you're with us. My show is all about different aspects of the human connection, things that bring us together and living life intentionally. We live in a society that focuses on our differences. And in America, nothing divides us more than race. Racially charged incidents have been on the rise in our country. And we change that by having tough conversations with people who do not look like us. Joining me today are friends of mine, many of which do not look like me. Susana, I'm Hispanic, specifically Mexican. I'm Rachna, and I'm Hindu, and I'm Indian. I'm Jennifer, I'm Caucasian, and I'm also Jewish. My name is Jason. I am Asian, specifically Filipino. My name is Steve, <laughs> and I am the white guy. I am Ernest, and I'm representing the black delegation. I'm African American. Before we get into our discussion, I'd like to cover a few definitions. Prejudice, a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. Racism, prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. A bias is a tendency to lean in a certain direction, often to the detriment of an open mind, believing what you want to believe, refusing to take into consideration of others. So let's talk about racism. Can you briefly describe a time when you experienced racism? Well, sure, I have one. Uh, I went to a club one time with a friend who happened to be a large black man. It was an all black club and I was not welcome in there. So you've I uh, seen... stayed for one drink and we got out as fast as I could. So you've seen what it feels like to be in for the it. minority. You bet. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah? I asked to go and I got to feel firsthand uh, how unwelcomed I could feel in, in a situation like that. When I was a child, so we had neighbors, a neighbor boy who was hooting and hollering, pretending he was doing an Indian war hoop, and then he shot a BB gun through our window. Oh, wow. wow. As a kid, that was really scary. Ooh. I grew up in the Bronx and... Um, we, I got chased out of white neighborhoods most of my teenage years just for being on the block, just walking up the street. What are some of the stereotypes about your race? Oh, we're all racist. <laughs> That's a big one. Jews are stingy. We only care about money. Asians are brainiacs, but we can't drive. <laughs> <laughs> Black people are lazy, we love chicken, mm. uh, we love basketball, we can all play basketball. <laughs> yeah. And rappers. And, rap- and run fast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Mexicans are lazy, um, most of us are all undocumented, and I've all come to this country without papers. We get the worst stingy and trying to squeeze a dime out of everything. Sometimes racism can be amongst other races too. It's, I don't think it's always just whites versus minorities. Uh, do you feel like there's a particular race that, that's hardest on your race? I think appropriately, black people are hardest on white people because you know the history shows they ought to be. So at least that's my opinion. I think that uh, a variety of races around the world are hard <clears throat> on, on my race, on black people. Wherever I go in the world um, where, there, where it's not majority black, you hear stories whether it's specific to one immigrant community or the whole group, about the same kind of uh, disdain and racism. Oftentimes you see people kind of jumping on the bandwagon, right? Mm -hmm. They don't even know what they're racist about or or what the real issue is, Mm -hmm. but they see racism perpetuated in the media Mm -hmm. and then they jump on that. Anyone else? I feel like the blacks are hardest on Asians. Asians. Really? Indirectly. Right, simply because you're very vocal about it, and we feel like we don't get a chance to uh, to give our opinion. Right. It's interesting you say that because I feel actually that Asians tend to be the most racist um, towards Black people. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. My brother died when he was killed, mm-hmm. and the first thing all my relatives said was, "It's a Black man. It's a Black man." And my mm-hmm. sister and I actually prayed that it wasn't, and it wasn't. Yeah. But that was the yeah. first reaction. The instinct. The instinct. Is there prejudice or bias within your own race? Mm. Oh, God, yes. Tell me about it. 
I, I think in the black race, and I think it shows up in other races, I imagine, skin tone. Color. Light mm -hmm. is better and dark is, is worse. And in some rare situations, light is worse. And I've heard some of my friends who are mixed race feel that they've been discriminated against by full black versus their half black mm -hmm. uh, selves. So color and biracial, mixed yeah. race? Mm -hmm. Within the black race. I, I would have to say that's probably similar um, within my race as well because uh, I think when you're lighter skinned Mexican, it's more celebrated than if you're darker skinned um, Hispanic. So I think that that color does play some issue in that as well. We have that in the Indian world too, where it's your skin color as well as your caste. So if you're a high mm -hmm. caste and you're light skinned, mm -hmm. you're like a queen. Interesting. Here's a funny scenario. In the US, come summer, the sun is out. Everyone's outdoors soaking up the sun. If you were to go to the Philippines and it's um, sunny outside, everyone would be indoors. And if you were outdoors, you would find a lot of people walking with umbrellas mm -hmm. to provide shade so it don't get darker. Interesting. And it's just interesting because so many people want to be tan, right? right. Mm -hmm. That's the, 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 the self tanning and all that. Um, and so with minorities, it's in many ways the opposite. Mm -hmm. What frustrates you about your own race? Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yes, yes. People yeah. that give Jews a bad name yeah. is very, very difficult. And that's one of the really hard things is when you have like one bad apple, mm -hmm. you kind of feel like it colors the whole race. Yeah. Exactly. You just yeah. get one or two of those guys, and it's like, oh, the Harvey Weinsteins mm -hmm. or the. Some, mine, mine is uh, secret racists. People that feel that because I'm a white guy, they can say certain things around me, and that's going to be okay, and I get mm -hmm. deeply offended. And uh, then they, they find out that I, they can't say those things around me. Yeah. So, you know, that happens as well. I'm sure it does, where people assume. Yeah, I have secret a friend. Secret racists, they think that because they're around you, they can say whatever they like. Yeah. It's not yeah. the case. Yeah. I have a friend who's Hispanic, but he looks Caucasian. And so he gets a lot of uh, misappropriate mm -hmm. uh, information. People say a lot of the wrong things because they have no idea that he's actually Cuban. Mm -hmm. So, which is interesting. So for the past, I don't know, maybe five years, world-renowned chefs have said Filipino food is the next hot thing, but it's having a hard time getting to where it should be, right? And I think it's because I would say Asians, in particular Filipinos, lack bravery and pride in, in their cuisine that those who do offer the cuisine will only market within the community mm -hmm. and not the world, okay. right? So I think that is why Filipino food is having a hard time getting to where it should be, you know, per, per world-renowned chefs. I think within, within my race, there's a couple things, and I'll say them quickly, is one is uh, political purity tests every time there's a black candidate. We, 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 we uh, mm -hmm. hold our, our own candidates who are our color to a much higher standard, even though the stereotype is that we vote for anything black. No, we don't. We actually even put them through a harder test, including Obama before he finally won the support of our community. But that's the main one. And, and then the other is just people who uh, feel like there's one way to represent black. And, that's, and that you hear a lot of black people judging other people's blackness. Yeah. I don't like that. Well, the ideal of Western beauty, I think, is a big thing that's going on in the Indian world, where all the movie stars used to have more exotic looks, and now they all look like they're European. Yeah. And that's what's desired. Yeah. What race outside of your own do you identify the most with? Mm. Jewish. Jew, give a hug. Any race that suffered, you know, persecution in the yeah. past, certainly we identify with. Yeah. Yeah, I identify with the black race since I think um, my family's always told me if I was born a black man, I would be the angriest black man that ever met. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a revolutionary. Right. Yeah, exactly. The so. movement. Aww. <laughs> it was the only all love. Mm -hmm. I love it. I actually, one of my, one, and I'm going to sound like a person, I have, I have, all my friends are Asian. No, I have a very close uh, Filipino friend. And even before I met him, I had, I, I felt like I got along with a lot of the Filipino friends that I'd met over the years really strongly. And um, so with, even within the Asian race, it was Filipino. And then there's some, some Hispanic groups, particularly Puerto Rican and Dominican, who I really find that I have a real affinity to, Filipino, Dominican, and like Puerto Rican. I had a hard time with this question. I had to think about it. I don't, at least for me at this stage of my life, I do not, there's not a particular race that I'm more comfortable with. I just, I, I see everyone is equal now. 
market, mm-hmm. you know, especially now at this stage of my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think one is better than the other, mm-hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Of course, because then that would be racist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and well, if I can add one quick thing, I think I agree with you. I don't see anyone as, as uh, less than or more than. Mm-hmm. It's a comfort level for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For some reason, you know, my, the, people. We, my yeah, Filipino, some true. of my Filipino yeah. friends, for example, we joke about they like, oh, whatever, we're the blacks or the Asians. And I laugh and we make jokes like that. Uh, with each other, but it, it, that might offend someone, but at the same time, they're my friends who are saying it about themselves. And so we have an affinity, I don't know why, but we have an affinity that I feel comfortable with more than the others, but it doesn't mean I think they're better. I, I agree with that. I think um, when I think of my group of friends, it's I, I do have also an Asian friend that it's almost like we're the people that kind of stick out because we don't, we are different. Um, we're a lot of times uh, in the minority amongst our white friends, which I do relate to very well yeah. as well. But we can just say, oh, hey, you know, we're both here. Diversity's in the room. Yes. Right. Hey. Yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So, what is beautiful about your race? What are you most proud of? I think. Oh, I have one. Okay. I'm most proud of the fact that there are many people in my race who are willing to have blended families yeah. and yeah. want to seek, like I do, seek right. diversity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's that's yeah. one thing I'm proud of. I think our culture is very friendly. Um, I think our food is delicious. <laughs> yes, <honey. laughs> but mm-hmm. I I do think we're very welcoming, and I think we like to give people an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I'm most proud of the, the warmth that I feel uh, among other Jews and the acceptance. Um, and I also um, just feel uh, that we've just we represent maybe one percent of the population, yet we've overcome you know so much, mm-hmm. and we we're very successful in, in a whole as a as a people, and we work really hard. I think the the resilience mm-hmm. of the black community uh, around the world, the black diaspora they call it around mm-hmm. the world, is is amazing to me. When I think mm-hmm. about people who literally got out of slavery and turned around and built whole right. rich cities. Mm-hmm. it's mind boggling because I don't even know how to start a business and mm-hmm. I have two degrees, you know, so um, it's just amazing. I love how the Indian community isn't a community, it's all family. Everyone's an auntie or an uncle. Everyone's a cousin, everyone's a brother or sister. It yeah. isn't, you know, no one's a stranger. Yeah. So what? most of Asia is a third world country, right? right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you were to go to any part of Asia, you'd be fortunate to have a television in your, wow. in your home. Right. Yeah. They are so happy with what they have. They find they're able to find good things in in just about anything. Yeah. Let's talk about the next generation, because we've got all these experts here. What can we do to solve the problem of race in America in both small and big ways? You know, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I actually I mean, I feel like children are naturally um, just hardwired to be open and to be you know, accepting of other, I see it in my own children, um, to be what, embracing other races, other religions, other cultures. And I think the point is just keeping that, you know, having them hold on to that, you know, that, that sense of, of acceptance and, and openness. And, I, I, you know, that's... I would also have to say is keeping them strong mm-hmm. um, because they are going to be placed in situations that are going to be new to them, even even if your family has values of everyone is equal, it's mm-hmm. making sure that when they come home from school, when those questions arise, and giving, empowering them to stand up for what is correct. And mm-hmm. because that, there's peer pressure, there, they'll be falling into different situations that will be new to them. And it's just continuing to give them the strength and courage to, to Identif- stay, yeah. stay true to themselves. Identifying the emotions that they mm-hmm. have that are common emotions among all races. Right. You know. I think one of the things that's important is to model that behavior yourself Absolutely. for your right. children yes. and for right. people in your community. Yes. If you're modeling that behavior yourself, it's, it's, it's a more powerful tool. I would say spreading love, uh, teaching people to love themselves, teaching kids to love others particularly those who don't look like them. So we're gonna keep spreading love on Dana Being Dana when we come back.
This episode of Dana Being Dana is brought to you in part by the Wright Center for Women's Health, providing personalized luxury health care. Welcome back to Dana Being Dana, where we have been talking candidly about race. Joining me now are two chief diversity officers of two global law firms, Janai Givings Bailey from Perkins Coie and Corey Carew from Cypher Shaw. Corey, you're from Sierra Leone, born in Canada. <laughs> raised in Nigeria, and you've been in the U.S. for the past 26 years. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us how your international experience has shaped your views on race in America? Hmm. So I, I'll say that my background has allowed me to build into having a, a range of cultural fluency in dealing with race and diversity issues across all kinds of cultures. First thing to say is that when we're talking about race as a social construct, it can't be understood without context, history and understanding the, the systems and the processes of the society. So being able to understand race issues from multiple perspectives, being able to relate to different races from other dimensions other than skin tone, um, I think has allowed me to be able to come in and out of spaces, but also to be able to verbalize and give voice to concepts and ideas because I'm able to bring a different perspective to the table. People talk often about being color brave, color blind. What do those terms mean and what does it mean to be color brave or color blind? I love the concept of being color brave as opposed to color blind. As Americans, we have, because of our complicated history with race, we have been taught to not see race, to mm -hmm. not see color. Actually, it's impossible to not see color and to not see race, right? And so we have come up with this idea that in order to not be perceived as a racist, in order to not be perceived as prejudiced, we will say that we don't see color. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is that that actually suppresses our curiosity and it suppresses our opportunities to actually do the work, to see the differences that we have, to value those differences and to connect around our commonalities. And so the more modern thinking now is to actually be color brave, to develop the courage that we need to go forth and have those conversations, to be more curious and to engage across these lines of, of racial difference or commonalities. Yeah, everything that Janai said is absolutely true, but what it means in practical terms is we set ourselves up for failure as a society. When you say to someone that you're color blind, what you're essentially saying is, I don't see your experiences, I don't see your history. I don't see how the circumstances we're navigating right now impact you. And you can't go beyond that. And it's part of why we haven't made as much progress as a country when it comes to race. Because by saying don't talk about it, don't discuss it, don't acknowledge it, we create situations where we not only keep repeating the same mistakes, but we essentially are dismissing the experiences of others, and, and frankly, when we do try to talk about race, we don't do it well, yeah. because we've spent all this time saying, don't talk about it. And when you don't talk about things, you don't learn how to talk about them well, so. And so when people say, I don't see race, everybody is the same, the way people of color often receive that yes. statement is, you don't see me. Yes. You don't see me at yes. all. And that actually can be very hurtful. Yes. Unintentionally to the person who made the comment, yeah. but it's, it's that dangerous and that detrimental. I love that she said dangerous. I've told people, when you say you don't see race, what you're telling me is you could get me killed. It's true. It's true. Yeah. I need to see race and you need to think about it and you need to think about it when you're taking me places because <laughs> that's absolutely it true. can be dangerous. It, it yeah. can be. And yeah. when I see people, when I hear people say that they don't see race, I just think you're lying because I know you see race. <laughs> yes. I know you see this color. Yeah. I know just like you see gender. Yes. yes, absolutely. How does gender intersect with the race discussion? Mm. Yeah, so I love this intersectionality issue of um, race and gender. Um, it can be race and sexual orientation. We're all mu multi dimensional human beings. So I am not just a black person. Um, I'm also a woman. I'm also cisgender, which means that I identify with the gender in which I was born, which is female. Um, so many other points of common or, or, of intersection, right, that make me who I am as a person. Um, 
years ago, I remember someone asking me if I identified more as a black person or more as a woman. And that question really made me pause. And I thought hard about it, and I couldn't answer it. I'm like, I don't identify more as one or the other. It can be situational at different times. If I'm the only black person in the room, I'm certainly much more aware of my blackness. If I'm the only woman in, a, in the room uh, with other people of color, I'm probably a, a bunch of men of color, I am probably more aware of my, of my femininity, right? Um, so it really, it depends. But I don't think that we should ever put each other or ourselves into boxes or into situations where we have to choose one or the other. We are all multidimensional human beings. I think the question is even interesting, and it's the kind of question that you would get in a culture that is very race-focused, that someone would even ask you which one of those you identify or very binary. with more. Re binary, very binary and hierarchical, yes. right? Yes. As, if, as if you can rank your, right. your identities mm -hmm. in some way. Right. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. You both, as officers specializing in diversity and inclusion at your large law firms, work daily, not only to support the people in your firm, but also to spread the message of diversity, the value of diversity amongst the people uh, in your firm, your clients, et cetera. How do you recommend solving the problem of race in small, <laughs> in small ways? Oh. Right. How much time yes. Do we have? yes. Can we have a weekend retreat? There's so many tangible things that yeah. we can do in small ways. Yeah. You know, what do you tell the junior associate or the rain-making partner who doesn't see, who's colorblind, or yeah. um, the client who's really passionate about about race and wanting to get it right and diversity, you know, how do you, how do you suggest solving that problem? Two reactions. One, change is incremental and it takes time. Mm -hmm. And we are asking people to think about opinions that they've held about different races their entire lives, to question that and to dismantle it and to start to, to, to learn a new set of behaviors around that. And so there's, there's two approaches um, that have to be done simultaneously. One is an institutional awareness and change, and that means looking at our systems, our policies, our, our uh, practices, the way we do things, and looking for where there may, may, may be unconscious biases in the way there, and where there may be racial prejudice built into those systems. So the other approach is, is focused on, uh, on individuals. What can we as individuals do to effectuate change, um, both within our teams, within our communities, within our households. Uh, we are all empowered to, to effectuate that change. And like I said earlier, it's, it's incremental. You have to take baby steps. I think the first most important step is to learn where your biases lie. Mm -hmm. What, and we're talking about race in particular. So are there races in which you have a particular bias conscious or unconscious, and learn about that, and then seek to learn more about those races um, that you, with which you, you know, feel um, that you need to do the work. Um, there's a great resource that's available online called the Implicit Association Test. It's a free test that's online, and I always encourage people to start there. Um, and then after that, there's so much learning, there's so many books, there's so many podcasts, there's mm -hmm. so many TED Talks part of what we've done as a culture is we've chipped around the edges, mm. right? But, you know, when we first started talking, you asked me about this international background and, and in the context and the history of a society and how they interact with race is what helps define the situation. It's why race in Brazil is going to be different than here. It's why race in Haiti is not the same as here. It's why me growing up in Nigeria in a country where I was represented at every level even though I understood I was black, and even mm. though we had people who were not black, yep. has a different experience. And in the United States, you cannot discuss race and the problem of race without discussing power and the systemic, structural, and cultural nature of it. Economics. And so yeah. if we are to really solve the problem of racism, in addition to being color brave, um, and part of being color brave, is to really dig into where it's showing up and how the system itself holds it up. And we have to acknowledge that. And so all the training and all the personal and individual action only can work in intersection 
with addressing the system that holds the problem up. And you can't talk about race in America without talking about power and economics. And, 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 and oppression. Things. And oppression. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and racial trauma. The, 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 the trauma that people of color in this country um, have faced as a result yes. of being a person mm -hmm. of color, especially black people or African American people in this mm -hmm. country. One of the things that we have not done well as Americans is that we have not talked about race. We've been taught to be colorblind. Yes. We've been taught to not talk about these issues. And what we are realizing now is that we have done a great disservice to yes. ourselves yes. Um, in that approach. And we are beginning to now have these difficult conversations, mm -hmm. these, these really powerful conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would also just encourage people, because the topic is emotional, yes. it's scary, it is, people don't know all of the right words. You There's know, so I, many nuances. That's right. And that's layers. Right. And yes, yes. And so I would implore people to be patient with themselves and to be patient with others as yeah, well. Absolutely. And I to would listen. say another step, you know, <laughs> one, no, seriously. So the two that I would say, similar to yours, the, the institutional structural piece. The second is choosing courage and redefining yes. what courage is. And I feel as if, if I look back at my work in the last three to four years, I've been talking a lot more about that. Mm -hmm. It takes courage to step in and say, I'm going to interrupt bias, or I'm going to mitigate bias, or I see racism, or I'm going to take this cause on. And for so many people, they disengage because it feels too big, or it feels too emotional. Yeah. And so asking people to do things that we know need to be done that are important, but they don't want to do, that's courage. Experiencing fear or anxiety or unease in terms of trying to engage with a topic or with an issue or circumstance, whether it's Uncle Bob at the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> right? Everybody has an Uncle Bob. Everybody <laughs> has Uncle Bob. Absolutely. Or it's something at the workplace that you're witnessing, you're seeing, you're hearing that you know is wrong. Um, the, it takes courage to step in and do something. And that's the piece that we have to not just talk about in the abstract, but talk about concrete skills. Yes. Being vulnerable and acknowledging that you're going to make mistakes, you're going to get it wrong, you're going to say the wrong thing, yep. but that it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And it's saying okay. something wrong is sometimes better than saying, saying nothing, nothing at, at all. all. Absolutely. And you, and you can always apologize. You know, I often tell um, or, or share with, with people that I'm training and working with that if you don't say something wrong, if you don't make a mistake, you're probably not doing enough work, yes, right? Yes. I even make mistakes, and I've been doing this work for 12 years, yes. right? I still make mistakes. Have some humility and apologize. And an apology goes a long absolutely. way. And that's where the growth comes from. That's yes. absolutely right. That's and that's absolutely vulnerability. Right yes. Because you, vulnerable. it will make you feel unsafe. It yep. will make you exposed. But you have to lean in. Lean and you have to be it. willing to say, I'm sorry that offended you but I'm trying to learn. Yes. Yes. And another component of, of this courage is cultivating curiosity, mm -hmm. to ask questions, to learn, to say, and when you ask a question to learn, somebody may be offended, like, seriously, you don't know that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. But you have to or, be willing to say, or, I apologize, I'm trying to, to learn. learn. That's right. That's I'm right. trying to learn. Right. right. Um, and those and are, by the same token, People on the other side have to be willing to teach. They have to yeah. be willing, to, be to, willing teach. to share. And, so, yeah. and we have to, as the person who is the who is trying to learn, as the one who is curious, you also have to give that person the space because totally. chances are they've been teaching and, and they're sharing tired. a long time, their yeah. entire lives, and they're tired. They've been explaining. They're sick and tired. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and so they may not want to teach that yeah. day. And as the curious person, you have to give them that space, and that should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you to all of my guests for joining me for such an important discussion that impacts us all. I believe that you have more in common with people who do not look like you than you think. It is only through conversation, compassion, and understanding that we can solve some of our country's problems around race. It is only through spreading love and not hate that we can heal our country for generations to come. Hopefully you have been entertained, if not encouraged or inspired. I do not promise to be an expert, nor do I have all the answers. I'm just Dana, being Dana. See you next time.